hidden away deep in the abdomen are some of the most troublesome organs, the pancreas and gallbladder. One in five of us will suffer from gallstones and their complications. Acute and chronic pancreatitis are important causes of morbidity that follow on from stones. And then there's pancreatic adenocarcinoma, the hidden killer, the cancer that is the fourth most deadly cancer in the body. We're going to talk about all these things today. Let's start with gallstones. There are three different kinds of gallstones classified on what they're made from. Cholesterol stones, as the name suggests, are mainly due to accumulations of cholesterol. Pigment stones are made from a mixture of bilirubin and calcium salts. And then there are the mixed stones, which are the most common stones, which are a mixture of cholesterol and the calcium bilirubinate that's usually found in pigment stones. The picture here shows a gallbladder full of stones. They're little stones and it's the little stones that cause the problem because they pass through the neck of the gallbladder and into the common bile duct where they can cause obstruction. Notice how the stones are faceted. They rub against each other. So rather than being truly round, they're often angulated as seen here. Normally in the bile, cholesterol remains in suspension, dissolved as little vesicles in the bile salts and helped along by lecithin. But if the bile is super saturated with cholesterol, crystals form and the crystals clump together to form stones. Poor emptying either from poor contractility or an anatomic variant where the bile duct is at a kinked angle can further concentrate the bile. In this concentrated bile, gallstones form. The risk factors for gallstones are increasing age. One in five females over the age of 40 will have gallstones. People who are obese have more gallstones because they have a higher cholesterol that's being made and excreted by the liver. There's a hormonal influence on who gets gallstones. People on oral contraceptives and pregnant women have a higher risk of gallstones. They're also increased by family history and diabetes and weight loss as the cholesterol is flushed out of the liver during weight loss, it accumulates in the bile and causes stones. Pigment stones are composed of primarily bilirubin mixed with calcium salts. So the risk factors here are different from the cholesterol stones. Conditions that have a high haemoglobin turnover, like hemolytic anemia and sickle cell anemia, increase the excretion of bilirubin into the bile and so cause bile stones. These pigment stones are also increased in cirrhosis and in people who have infections in the gallbladder, like E. coli and liver fluke. Because of these things, they're more common in developing world populations who have a higher risk of conditions with haemoglobin turnover, more cirrhosis, often from high hepatitis B infection rates, and an increased incidence of liver flukes. In the picture to the right, you can see a large cholesterol stone impacted in the neck of the gallbladder and the smaller, darker pigment stones still in the body of the gallbladder. Gallstones can cause a whole world of mischief. They can affect the gallbladder, 
causing acute and chronic cholecystitis and biliary colic. They can get stuck in the common bile duct, causing cholecholithiasis and ascending cholangitis. They can just block the whole system off. That means that all the pigment gets reabsorbed and the gallbladder is left as a bag of mucus, the gallbladder mucosal. All that irritation to do with concentrated bile and stones can give rise to carcinoma of the bladder. Sometimes, if they're really big, they can escape directly from the gallbladder into the ileum and cause obstruction, gallstone ileus. And then gallstones can travel down the common bile duct and obstruct the pancreatic duct, giving rise to acute pancreatitis. Ninety percent of cases of acute cholecystitis are due to gallstones obstructing the neck of the gallbladder or the adjacent cystic duct. When the neck or the duct is obstructed, it leads to an increase in intraluminal pressure within the body of the gallbladder and distension of the gallbladder. This leads to impaired blood and lymphatic flow and thus relative ischemia and mucosal injury. Acute cholecystitis can also be enhanced by the direct chemical irritation of the concentrated bile in the gallbladder. The other 10% is caused by direct seeding of bacteria into the gallbladder but most commonly bacterial infection is a secondary event to the obstruction caused by stones. The infection travels up the common bile duct and infects the gallbladder. Chronic cholecystitis is one of the most common specimens that I see in my clinical laboratory practice. Chronic cholecystitis presents as a gallbladder that may or may not have stones, but always has a very thickened wall. In the wall, there is a chronic inflammatory infiltrate, fibrosis and muscular hypertrophy, and little tiny diverticuli where the mucosa pushes out through the wall that we call rokitansky ashoff sinuses. A variation of chronic cholecystitis is the porcelain gallbladder, where the gallbladder becomes calcified in the fibrotic wall and turns into a structure that resembles an egg. Acute pancreatitis can be caused by gallstones, alcohol and a whole lot of other things, but we're going to concentrate on the two main causes. Gallstones and alcohol have a similar etiology in acute pancreatitis. They cause obstruction of the pancreatic duct. Gallstones clearly by forming a physical block. In alcoholics, protein, thick, cluggy protein blocks the pancreatic duct. Once the duct is blocked, lysosomal enzymes inappropriately activate trypsinogen to form trypsin. So the proenzyme becomes the enzyme trypsin, not in the small bowel where it's usually dissolving food proteins, but in the pancreas itself where it gets busy dissolving all the proteins in the pancreas. This includes things like cell walls, duct, supporting tissues. The action of the trypsin leads to inflammation, edema, vascular injury as it eats through the walls of the vessels and widespread necrosis, cellular death. In acute pancreatitis, amylase, the protein that digests carbohydrate and lipase, the protein that digests fat, are released into the blood. 
If the levels are three times higher than normal, this is a good indication that pancreatitis is present. Lipase is the more sensitive and specific blood test to do. And often we don't need to do amylase. The graph at the right shows how lipase increases and then decreases with time after an attack of acute pancreatitis. Note that it takes approximately four hours to start rising, peaks at 24 hours and then has a long tail, out to 14 days. Chronic pancreatitis is also due to intraductal plugging and obstruction, but in a more long-term way. Again, with alcohol, the protein secretions by acinar cells combined with decreased fluid production by ductal cells lead to this viscous material building up in ducts and blocking them. The toxins in acute pancreatitis act in a lower key way on acinar cells, causing release of cytokines and inducing fibroblastic stellate cells to produce collagen. Chronic pancreatitis is a fibrotic disease. The pancreas is destroyed by fibrosis. Recurrent acute pancreatitis that heals with fibrosis can also go on to chronic pancreatitis. Similarly, ischemia which results from blood vessel obstruction, perhaps by the fibrosis that's surrounding it, perpetuates the disease. Pancreatic ductal carcinoma is a feared malignancy because it has a very poor outcome. It's the fourth most common cause of cancer death in men and the fifth in women. It's a disease of older age, most commonly presenting over the age of 60, and people who've had a high fat diet, smoke, have diabetes, a history of chronic pancreatitis, or have a familial cancer syndrome, all have an increased risk of getting pancreatic ductal carcinoma. Most cases of pancreatic ductal carcinoma occur in the head and neck of the pancreas. This is, after all, where most of the exocrine glands live. Smaller numbers occur in the body and tail. Because most tumours occur in the head of the pancreas, they can present by obstructing the distal common bile duct, leading to distension of the biliary tree and jaundice. Any cases of jaundice, particularly painless jaundice, must be investigated for pancreatic carcinoma. Pancreatic carcinomas are adenocarcinomas. They arise from the ductal epithelium and they're highly invasive. The picture on the right here shows a cancer inside a nerve. Nerves are highways for pancreatic ductal carcinoma to spread at an early stage outside the pancreas and thus become irresectable. Similarly, the larger amount of lymph nodes around the pancreas means it metastasizes early. This means that the five-year survival overall for pancreatic carcinomas is only 6%. And even in very small cancers, which are only about two centimeters in size, the five-year survival is a terrible 20%. So in this video, we've thought about gallstones, how they form, the different types and all their complications. We've learned that stones and alcohol are really important in acute pancreatitis. And alcohol is also very important in chronic pancreatitis. We've learned about that deadly disease, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and how its key symptom, jaundice, must be investigated early to give a patient any chance 
of surviving adenocarcinoma.